armor of God. And you know, we could spend forever on the armor of God. I heard one preacher, uh, he preached on the same theme for 40 years. And somebody asked him, well, when are you going to preach something new? And he said, you know what, as soon as they get this, I'll move on to something new. <laughs> and uh, we could spend a lot of time in the armor of God. But, uh, you know, I wanted just to put that taste in your mouth, give you a little bit of food for thought throughout these past seven weeks. And um, hopefully you'll be able to build on that in your own time, in your own way. Uh, many believers approach the idea of spiritual warfare like cold medicine. The cold is a virus. It's a virus. And medicine cannot get rid of the cold. cannot cure a cold. It's a virus. You can take anything you want. You can take as much as you want of it. But it's not going to get rid of the cold. It's not going to lessen or the, the, it's not going to shorten the length of the cold. Now, it'll mask the symptoms. It'll make you feel better. If you take medicine, it'll help maybe take away your sore throat for a little bit. Take away that cough. Maybe take away your runny nose. But it's not going to take away the cold itself. It is a virus. When it comes to spiritual warfare, believers tend to want to mask the problems rather than deal with the problems. In our war against the enemy, we must treat the root problem. Yes, we have to deal with the physical symptoms. We have to deal with the physical. But unless we defeat the root cause, attack it at a spiritual level, our work is useless. And so when it comes to spiritual warfare, we're dealing with a lot of physical ailments. And we can put band-aids on those physical ailments. But unless we're willing to acknowledge that there's a spiritual world and that there's a, an enemy, the devil, and his demons at work from the spiritual world, we're always going to have those physical problems. We're never going to get it anywhere. I want to look this morning first at Acts chapter 3. I mentioned this a week or two ago, part of this story, and I want to go back to it for a different reason to help kind of highlight what I just said. Acts chapter 3, first eight verses. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Peter says, I do not have any money for you. You know, and part of the problem in our society today, and even in the churches in general, big part of the problem, is the churches think that they can solve the world's problems by simply giving money. Let's give money to missions. Let's give money to this. Let's give money to that. World's problems will be solved. We can solve hunger by doing that. They think that if they raise just enough money, that they will be fulfilling that great commission of spreading the good news and making disciples of nations, of all nations. Now imagine if Peter did have money. Imagine if Peter did have money and he gave some money to that beggar. Chances are the next day or the next day or two, that beggar would have been right back in that same spot asking for money. The problem isn't resolved. The problem hasn't been solved. It's only been put off for a little while. It's been masked. And that's what many churches are satisfied doing today. They're satisfied addressing the physical, 
You got a problem, let's put a band-aid on it. All right, that takes care of that. They're good at taking care of masking the physical problems. And then they wonder why the problem isn't solved, why it never changes. And that's because they never address the spiritual problem. They never tackle the root of the problem. Peter recognized that even though he could not, did not physically possess anything that could help this man physically, he possessed something that was far greater. He possessed spiritual authority over this man's problem. Peter recognized that there was a spiritual element at work here. The man needed a spiritual solution. He needed something more than money. And the same is true of so many things that we encounter as a church. The problems may manifest in the physical, but there are really spiritual problems underneath. Spiritual problems that manifest physically. James encourages us now to give. He encourages us to give and to help where we are able to help, to help with things that are tangible. He says that we have an obligation to do that. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be sending money. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing that stuff. But we also have to have the spiritual discernment to know when the problem is deeper than something physical. We have to know that our real fight, even though it shows up in the physical, is sometimes happening in the spiritual. The unseen world. The invisible world. Too many believers wave off the spiritual as hokey pokey. And the devil loves that. The devil loves it when you ignore the spiritual aspect of the Bible. Because it makes it so much easier for him to attack. So much easier for him to manipulate. So much easier for him to persuade. But if you do acknowledge that there is a spiritual world, if you do recognize, like what Paul tells us, that there's unseen forces, dark forces, that we are at battle with, and you do what you need to do to be protected, then you'll become out victorious. And that's why Paul gives us this advice in chapter 6 of Ephesians, our key scripture for this series. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. Paul begins his scripture here, this key scripture, by telling us to be strong and to be in the power of his might. Strong and power. And how do we do this? We do this by putting on the whole armor of God. Think about the battles of Paul's day. The foot soldiers that would face off against one another. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of soldiers facing one another on a battlefield. And in the rear of each, of each group is a general throwing out the commands, controlling the action. You go this way. You go that way. You do what needs to be done here. You do what needs to be done here. And the ultimate goal of each soldier is to reach the opposing general. You cut off the head of the snake, you kill the snake. They want to get to that general. But before you can get to that general, you have to fight your way through the many individual battles on the field. We are in God's army. We are soldiers of God's army. He is our general. And the general calling the shots on the opposing side is the enemy. And under his command, the demons are going to do what he tells them to do, which is going to cause us problems 
Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.4 says that when we are under attack, we need divine power to demolish the strongholds. And that's why putting on the whole armor of God is so important. It's not Satan who's picking people off in battle. It's the individual soldiers. It's the demons that Satan has commanded. It's that demon of alcohol. It's that demon of pornography. It's that demon of, of uh, gossip. It's that demon of whatever. You name it. Whatever it is that's causing you, separating you from God in that moment is a demon that's under the control of Satan. Paul says, put on that armor of God in order to protect yourselves from the schemes of the devil to not come down and walk over him. So the first thing he tells us to put on, and I'm not going to go over each and every piece of the armor this morning, I just want to highlight a couple. Because I think these are two that are very important. One is the belt of truth. Establishing within yourselves that the word of God is true, period. If you do not accept that the word of God is true 100%, period, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Think about a child's faith in his or her parent. I'm talking about a little child, not teenagers who, who blow off parents' advice as hokey pokey. I'm talking about the little kids who look up to their mom and dad, don't believe anything that their mom and dad tell them. Three, four, five years old, if you tell your child that the, that the world is flat, they're going to go, okay. And if they go to school, kindergarten, and their teacher says the world is round, that kid will defend you left and right. They don't care what that teacher says. If your mom or dad says it, it is the truth. If your mom and dad tells that little kid that the dinosaurs still live in China, that kid's going to believe it. Okay. <clears throat> Absolutely. Okay. That's the kind of attitude, submission, that we are to have with God, who is our Heavenly Father. If God says it, it's true. If He makes a promise, He's going to follow up with that promise. We need to embrace that word like a child embraces the words of his or her as absolute truth. If you don't, if that truth has not been established within you, then the moment that the devil comes along and says, it's alright to steal that candy bar. You haven't eaten. Remember last month when you were supposed to get back 64 cents and she only gave you 63 cents? You earned that candy bar. Right? You deserve it. You're going to take it. Why? Because you have not established within yourselves the morality of God. And if that's not established within you, there's no room for the Holy Spirit to come in and work or convict you. The helmet of salvation is one that I really love. When I began to put this, uh, this series together and looking ahead, and I came to the helmet of salvation, I thought, oh man, what a boring sermon that's going to be. What a boring topic that's going to be. But the more I've looked at the, at the helmet of salvation, the more I really love it because it's a piece of armor that we can easily see affecting our world today. It's a piece of armor that we can apply today so easily. The idea of a helmet protecting our minds from the pollution that is in our world, filling our minds with junk, rather than with the Word of God. The helmet protects our minds. When we're saved, we're set apart. We're set apart. And that's the time when it's time to engage in God's Word. So many people come forward and I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and then go back to their seat and that's the end of it. That should be just the beginning. That's the time when we begin to engage in God's Word. You can't just come up here and accept and then go back to your life as you knew it. You have to actively grow with Christ, which means filling your mind with the godly, not the worldly. Remember, I think it was last week, maybe the week before, when I talked about how, you know, the, the, the sword of the Spirit, how, this isn't the Word of God. You can carry this around and you can have it in your car or you can keep it on your dresser or on your coffee table, but that's not the Word of God. It's what's inside that's the Word of God. If you never open it, never fill your minds with the truth that God has for you, then it's useless. It's useless. I remember watching a video a while back of a group of young kids. Once again, we're talking seven, eight years old, maybe. And they were being asked questions by somebody, a facilitator, maybe a pastor, I can't remember, but 
one of the questions that this, this, uh, he asked had to do with their perception of the world. It was, you know, you will, you're going to get married when you grow up? And one of the little boys immediately spoke up and he said, yeah, I'm going to get married several times. <laughs> and the guy said, what, what do you mean? And what was funny was all the kids looked confused that he didn't know what he was talking about. You know, the girls were agreeing with the boy, yeah. And what, what, what happened, what turned out is these kids, their perception of the world was based on the reality TV and stuff that they were watching. And they believe, yeah, when I, as I get older and in high school and college, grow up, you know, I'll be with this person for a while, we'll break up, and then I'll go be with her friend for a while, and then they'll break up, we'll get back together, and this and that. And that was their idea of what real life was. And it was very scary. And like I said, when he, when he asked them, what are you talking about? I mean, they, they were just as confused as he was because they couldn't, they were like, well, what do you mean what are we talking about? What are, this, is, this happens all the time. This is life. And that's what happens when we fill our minds with the world rather than with God. The helmet of salvation reminds us of whose we are. We are God's. Sealed by the Spirit, protected by the Spirit, the helmet reminds us that we must protect our minds. And we have to do that consciously. We have to do that every day. From the filth that leads us away from God, filling our minds instead of the filth of the world with the glorious word of God. When you think of the helmet of salvation, let that remind you. Because you're going to come across a time today, tonight, tomorrow, when something's going to come across your path, whether it's on radio or on TV or a group of people you're speaking with, something. And something's going to be there that's not godly that's going to try to get into your mind. That's when you say, stop. You've got the helmet of salvation on and you don't want that in there. You don't need it corrupting the rest of what's in there. The armor of God. There's a lot there. And I'm going to stop there. There's a lot there. And I hope the series has been informative for you. I hope that there's something you can take away from it. Uh, you know, I hope you've heard something. But as always, there's more to it than hearing. Now you have to do. You have to respond. You have to be active. You have to engage God. You have to engage His Word. This isn't God's dead Word. This is God's living Word. Moving. And you need to engage it, to become a part of it, to allow it to become a part of you and your everyday life. Break free from where you are right now in your journey. Some of you may still be, you may be held captive right now by something. There may be something in your life that's holding you captive because you have been unwilling, unable, to let it go, to give it to God, to embrace or accept God's truth, whatever it is. I can talk about the armor of God for 40 years if you want, but it's not going to do any good for you personally until you take that next step and open His Word and begin to apply it to your lives. So I invite you as we turn to our hymn of invitation to reflect on the series as a whole, to reflect on the words you heard this morning, to respond to those words from where you're sitting. I mean, all it takes is for you to take a moment and just say, Lord, I hear you, I feel you, guide me. What's that song we sing? We may be singing it today. I think something that I'm, the, the song, I mold me, shape me, make me uh, who you want me to be. Spirit of the living God, I think, is what it is. Just say that this morning from where you're at. And take that first step. But then when you walk out these doors, don't forget about it. When you walk out these doors, remember, open that Bible, open that Word. Did engage. So let's stand. Uh, there's something about that name, number 105, this morning. And we'll sing it through.